Today's podcast is brought to you by Funny Bone Broth, now available at Italy and McEwen's in the TD Center. Or you can visit them at funnybonebroth.com. In a world where it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts, it's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos podcast. I'm Ben Grant, joined again by JB. This is going to be our depth chart episode. Uh, you may have noticed that I put out a far too early depth chart, really for the point of conversation uh, more than anything else. Uh, and we got quite a, quite a lot of feedback on the, on the initial depth chart. So this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about it, talk about some of the, the positional battles and address some of the tweets we received with regards to the depth chart. So uh, why don't we go, why don't we start with the tweets? Is that all right with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for social media action. All right, let's, let's give it a go. So, so from CFL Fans Toronto, at CFL Fans Toronto, uh, they had a couple things to add. So first they said Boateng only played corner last year, and I've got Boateng uh, lined up uh, as a halfback. Uh, so like for me, I think a great way to start into especially on a team that has some holes like we did last year. I think field corner is a great place to start and Boateng getting his first real you know, real action last year. It was a good place to put him, get him acclimated a little bit. But now that he's got that experience under his belt, he really is suited better to being a halfback, I think, anyway. I love his combination of of length and speed. So I don't mind. Like I find DB positions I find largely to be interchangeable. Yeah, especially halfback cornerback. Yeah, like and because you're basically like halfbacks are essentially have become essentially nickel corners, and while it's a different position, I think those guys can can go back and forth. Like like Darby last year played, I think every single spot in the defensive backfield. Yeah, halfbacks are definitely more like for for a while their halfbacks had become almost um, you know two extra linebackers in some cases. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that's not the case anymore. I think you want, you want speed. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, another comment he had was that uh, Radford has only played safety and really is just a special teamer. I, and I don't disagree. When I'm making this depth chart, I'm not really doing it for a season game. So I've got Radford at corner, not because I think he's going to play corner. I don't, I think he is largely going to be, if he's, you know, if he ends up, dressing he's going to be largely a special teams contributor but you just don't want to have like 15 guys lined up at one position so ideally you spread everybody out yeah and when you look at the we've talked about one of the big problems or challenges a team is faced with the number of guys they have in camp in the secondary you know practice evaluation is going to be so important because they're not going to be able to get enough looks in two exhibition games yeah, no, exactly that. And I think that's one of the comments that that we'll get to a bit later. Like if you're trying to put 16 guys at, at safety to take a look at, you just don't have enough time. You have to be subbing guys in every every series. So by dividing it up a little bit, you put Radford out a corner, see what he looks like there. I, I you know, maybe your mind's already made up on some of these guys, but yeah, for the most part, I think you try and spread it out as much as you can so you don't have an overloaded position and a position with only two guys on it uh, for, for camp, certainly, but also for preseason. Uh, he talked about, this is kind of interesting. So he talked about the Canadians as well. And his, in his tweet, he said, Canadians, Lacombo, Aki, Quimo, Anyaka, uh, he has at Wills. And he actually made a depth chart, which is pretty interesting. If you go to at CFL fans, Toronto, you can see his depth chart, which I actually thought was really good. And uh, he's got his Canadians grouped together, which makes sense in terms of, you know, keeping your ratio, if you have Canadians lined up at one positional group, then that never causes you problems with replacements. But I, at this stage of the season, I'm not thinking at all in terms of really where my Canadians are. This is just a camp and and a preseason depth chart. And we'll have to figure out, you know, where we go from there. And I, I made sure I had enough Canadians on the field, but I'm not really thinking about you know, substitutions and, and things like that. Well, I guess it depends how much they start accessing this new way of having Americans step in for injured Canadians. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I want to talk about maybe for a later podcast, but 
I, I wonder how that's going to go. We'll see if anyone's abusing that this year. Because I think as soon as that becomes an issue, that's a rule that's that's going to change or have to be tweaked a bit. Yeah, because you could, you could, you, you, I mean, I think, you know, without getting too in the weeds, I think that, you know, if you, if you start, I, th- I think it puts you in a position where you probably do want to start Canadians, um, you know, and, and give yourself that opportunity to, you know, potentially have a guy second on the depth chart, but, you know, first in your heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll see if, we'll see if any of that goes on, you know, hopefully not. I'd like to think that, you know, people understand the spirit of the rule, but <laughs> it's professional football we're talking about. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and the last thing he said was that, um, he felt like Moore was brought in to push bear at, at, uh, at Mac or Mike. Uh, I've got, so I've got bear actually a second on my depth chart, uh, for the Mac linebacker spot. I, I put Knox Jr. there, which, you know, I'm not 100% on. He was so good in 2015, and I know that was five years ago. Well, but I maybe think if he's... He could be a running back then. <laughs> he was he was a running back at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, he was actually a, a pretty good running back in college, and then he then he switched over uh, to linebacker. But he's, he's good. Uh, Knox Jr. is good, and I think if, you know, I would like to see him in that spot. I just don't think... I like Bear. I don't think Bear is going to be the guy. I think he's he's there for leadership. He's wonderful in the clubhouse. If someone gets injured, great. He can play the position very well. But I think with all of these guys we've got here, I can't see a situation where where Bear is there. And I, I think Bear is better than than Moore. And so while he may have been brought in to push Bear a little bit, I I don't see Moore getting on the field before Bear does. And I see Knox Jr. as being better than Bear. So that's sort of how that that shook down for me. But again, like this isn't <laughs> this. I, I'm wrong a lot. I, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if if Bear didn't start. It'll be it'd be a very interesting um, statement, I think, by the DC uh, if he didn't start Bear. I get that, and I know I know what it means to start Bear, and I think that's I I, I understand why a coach would do that. And I'm not saying I wouldn't do that in a coaching position too, because I think there's something about, you know, keeping your clubhouse together and, and, you know, things like that. But I just don't think, I, I don't think he, I don't think he's the same Bear Woods that he was a few years ago. I, you know, I, I think once we get into the season, I just, I'm just not sure he's going to be the starting, the starting middle linebacker. Well, I, I will, I will say for me, when in the, if we're talking linebackers before we jump to the next tweet, um, you know, I'm a huge uh, Lacombo fan. Um, I I thought, I mean, I think he's a star. I think if he is used properly, he is absolutely um, a tone setter, game changer. You know, I think I think if 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 used properly, I mean, you can't you can't put him in space and you you can't ask him to do things that are not in his skill set. But I think absolutely. Um, he should be somebody who lights up the crowd and really like, uh, you know, I, I have really high hopes for him. I do too. I like him a lot, but I've got Gilchrist in front of him on the depth chart, but I could, I could completely yeah, see I, that. I think that's becoming, probably true. I think you probably bring, you know, you might bring him in on second down. And and then there's, you know, more as well, but I think Gilchrist Lacombo would be a pretty nice camp battle, wouldn't it? I think so. I mean, they have these slightly different skill sets. I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure Lacombo is a starter, uh, but I. I do think it'd be very interesting to see um, that he. You know, he might be a guy that really. I mean, he strikes me definitely as a player who will shine at camp. You know, he will be. Uh, a, you know, he delivers wild plays. Um, so it'd, I'd be curious to see if the coaches uh, fall in love with him or not. Well, he's such an energy guy. It's hard not to fall in love with him. Like, yeah, I yeah. Think, I I thought I I you know I was really surprised that uh, that he was available. Yeah, no, for sure. All right, we'll go to our our next tweet, which came from Will at Argos at Argo Fans, and uh, Will wanted to know why I've got Randy Richards ahead of Jamal Campbell at right tackle, uh, and you know that's I, I I don't I don't know if I know. Um, they're they're pretty close. Uh, I ultimately like Richards a little bit better. 
uh, I'll always fight for Campbell. He's he's a York guy. He's a Canadian guy. I think that's that's fantastic. Richards, an American. Uh, ideally, you know, Campbell wins that battle. I just think in in watching them play and watching their their film, especially you know Richards' film from uh, from I guess two seasons ago, uh, he's good. And I know you put those two guys next to each other. Campbell's the guy that looks like the right tackle at at six six three oh five. But Richards is sound. It's really hard to beat him around the edge. And just, you know, he's, he's still 6'3". It's not like he's, he's like, you know, 5'5 five, five or anything. But, yeah, he's, he's noticeably shorter than, than Campbell. It doesn't, you know, he looks more like a guard probably than a tackle. But I think he plays that spot really well. Like, he played, he played that spot in the, in, in the Grey Cup. So, uh, you know, he's, he's good. So I see him winning out that battle. And I think if we've got enough Canadians in other spots, which it seems like we do, then you can afford to have an American uh, as as a right tackle. Yeah. Do you, like, do you feel three Canadian linemen starting is a lot? Well, typically you do have three. Like typically there's almost every team has a Canadian center starting. And, you know, I think we're definitely going to have Blake and, 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 and Bladek as the starting guard. So I think, I think we'll have our two guards as Canadians, but I'm not sure anymore. I had, I had Starchala in at center to start with initially, because there weren't really any other centers on our, our depth chart. But as we've signed a few players, I, I now kind of like uh, Ty Allen, uh, maybe starting over Starchala instead of, you know, instead of putting in a, like Starchala from, from Guelph, who, I really like as a tackle. He's played center, but not since 2016. And it really wasn't his best spot. He was much better at tackle than he was at center. I only put him at center because we just didn't have anyone else. And now that we bring in Ty Allen, who's who's got a couple of years experience on and off at center guard, I think he probably, if it's just the two of them, I think he probably wins that battle. I'm not sure we're not going to draft a center though. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all you know, having asked that question, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Again, I think that, I think they're interested in probing um, weaknesses in the um, roster rules. You know, I think that, you know, I think that they're looking for an edge. I think you're looking for um, a market inefficiency and, you know, maybe. Yeah, you could go one way or the other, but I think teams have tried that. Like, I think a lot of teams stack their Canadians on the offensive line. And uh, and linebacker. That's typically where you see your your Canadians distributed. There's usually one receiver and then one DB, uh, and then and that's sort of where your your Canadians are at. But I, I see. I think that the market inefficiency here comes in the Canadian receivers, which is what I see them doing with bringing some of these Canadian guys in, like like Breskison and and you know we'll see what happens with with Jones as well. But uh, we you know we've got a Jay in there and. And Breskison and you know maybe Jones, uh, that's suddenly having three Canadian receivers starting potentially. Yeah, that, that's I, interesting. Yeah, I think that's I think that's smart. I think it's you know I think it's smart to try. Um, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's okay. But I think that you definitely want to try things. I think you don't want the roster to look like an average roster. I think that you want to experiment. Um, not recklessly, but I think you want to experiment with um, more unusual ratios at at different positions to see if you can um, if you can find a little something there. The next tweet we had was from Jay Driscoll 3 at Jay Driscoll 3 He says, "I'm actually shocked at how much depth at receiver we have, and I'm sure that DJ Jones will will get worked out as well. I'm sure too." Agree with running back as well. I think Carlos will shine in his second chance. <laughs> so, are you are you going to take issue with well, second look, chance? I'm not, or? you know, looking to be the Carlos Williams hater club. Um, he and I had a very successful interaction in fantasy football a couple of years ago, <laughs> and uh, you know, he went on like a five game streak, scoring touchdowns and uh, six. No, six even right. He was yeah. Um, you know, he was great. He was I don't amazing. Think I had him. He looked I don't think I had him for the first game of the streak. I, di- I didn't, didn't know who he was. Um, but you know, I, I liked him. I just think being out of football for a couple of years is, you know, 
is not a recipe for success. You know, it it's it's not you know it's not men's league, and so like has he been, you know, training hard? You know, hopefully. Um, I like to think he's rested. <laughs> I I I am not calling him a load bearing wall. Um, at this moment, we'll we'll see what he looks like in camp. Um, but you know, hope's not a plan. And I am ready to put all my eggs in the Carlos Williams basket. <laughs> oh, no more Bishop Sankey love. Well, no, I like Sankey too. I'll put all my eggs in the Sankey basket as well. I think it's going to be a tough competition between those two guys. But Sounds I think like a lot of eggs. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I feel strongly about it. But I like you know, I know everyone knows. And I think you know Jay Driscoll O three knows as well. There's a chance this this won't work out, but. I like the fact that we've got a few guys back there because, you know, if he fails, you've got Sankey. If he fails, you know, we're we're still OK. Um, you know, we, we've got thick pen that we that we brought in and I still like gray. There's there's a lot of answers there. So, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I mean, we, I mean, this was not a very good team last year. So there are going to be holes in the roster um, the next year. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not worried about it because yeah i mean you're not you know you're not going to have a great cup uh caliber roster um heading into camp the year after last year so you know we'll we'll see but uh you know i would love to see them make a trade maybe with some of their depth and i I don't think that's uh i i don't think that you know hasn't crossed their mind i think they're somebody's gonna need to be stacked oh yeah and we've got or d lyman yeah, like, or man, the alignment, even, alignment even more so. Yeah. And Ottawa, so our next tweet. Oh, I was going to say something slanderous. Continue. Our next tweet is from David Z at Argo Nuts. He says, we need three preseason games, which I think both you and I agree on. Not so much for the fans, just more for the coaches to try and figure out what they've got here. I don't know how you begin to evaluate this many guys that are so close to each other in terms of talent ability. Uh, he says the return of the the double blue game would be nice. Otherwise, I, I love those. I love the inner squad, you know, scrimmages where you sort of treat it as a game and have a scoring system set up. So you know, I, I would like to see you know something like that, a an offense versus defense, uh, but two units of it. So you have your your you know your blue side and your white side. Uh, I, I know a lot of NFL teams do that, and it actually draws quite well. So yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing one of those before the the preseason kicks off you don't have any interest in that <laughs> uh, um no no i i don't <laughs> i don't have any interest in that i i i would hope i would hope that um these you know that these decisions are being made in camp and that the preseason games should not have a great deal of impact on on the decisions that they're making because I, but you know, you know, as well as anybody though, like you can't, you can't just rely on camp. No, like it's no. Not I mean, same. it's true. I mean, you want to see them in a game position. Um, but I think that's like tweaking, you know, that's, that's not, I got 18 guys, you know, I think, I think that's when you're looking at like the last three guys on the roster, you want to see them in game situation. I would, I would think that you've got to be able to hack this down to manageable um, in camp. You hope you can, but it, we're going to miss on someone. Yeah. Like oh, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's definitely going to be a couple of these guys that end up, you know, Great kicking cup, our butts. Mean, great cup, yeah. Uh, starting in the Grey Cup. Yeah. Well, we've seen that before. <laughs> yeah. um, and don't really want to see that again. But uh, 100% it's going to happen on this roster. There will be guys that get let go. Because there's there's so many question marks, we just don't know. I don't think they're going to be able to evaluate it, uh, you know, with 100 percent accuracy. It's hard to do at the best of times, let alone when you have this many new faces. Yeah, it's exciting so, though. I mean, I it it's is. An, it's great. It's an I think exciting it's, group of talent that has not just bounced around the CFL. Um, I mean, who knows what shakes out? But um, you know, one of the things that definitely comes from looking at your depth chart is. They have a lot of lottery tickets, and there's at least three or four that could absolutely uh, be steals. 
Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Uh, Larry, let's go to our next tweet. This is from A. Chan at AYC2112. I think C. Worthy is a little high and Shelby a little low. And he also likes Carlos Williams. But let's talk about Worthy and Shelby. So, yeah, I've got Chandler Worthy starting uh, at receiver. And I, I think I have to agree. I know it's my own depth chart. I think he is a little high. But the thing is, I know what he is. And so that's why I've got him starting right now. I don't know for sure that any of these other guys that aren't starting are going to beat him out. I think it's very likely that one of them does. I just don't know who it is. And so for making up a preliminary depth chart, I've got Worthy there because I know exactly what Worthy can do. And if he gets you know beat out by by someone like like Zico or or Davis or Shelby or well, honestly, I think that's where that's where T.J. Jones actually ends up ends up playing if that ever comes through. But yeah, no, he's not wrong. I think Worthy probably is is a little high, but until I see the rest of these guys, I don't know that I can put anyone else in that spot. And as far as Shelby goes, maybe I have him low. Like certainly I have him like fourth string and he's he's good. He's the best receiver in McNeese State history. But I need to see him in I need to see him in in meaningful games. And I and I haven't. There aren't any meaningful, there's no meaningful NFL film. That I could get a, you know, there's, there's, there's camp reports. Uh, there's really just his McNeese state stuff. And I'm having trouble transferring that to starting in the CFL. So I think, you know, Worthy's my guy until, until someone shows me that he's not. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think that that spot is probably taken. I think it's probably not even really a debate in that. I, I, I don't think either, you know, ideally, either is a starter for us. I think that's an upgrade position. I think that's why they're probably still looking at Jones. Well, Jones uh, Jones changes this team around quite a bit because not only do we have another Canadian receiver starting because Jones obviously starts, but then you start thinking, oh, well, I wonder where because I'm not sure I would have I'm not sure I would have Jones out wide actually where I've got Worthy, so I might have to move move some guys around there. And I don't know if I want to put Daniels out there, but. But that would be interesting. And so maybe we can wait on that until, you know, fingers crossed, knocking on wood, TJ Jones signs with the Argos. But that's an exciting problem to have. All right. The next tweet is from the end zone blog at the end zone underscore blog. And they say, interesting that Thigpen doesn't get the starting role at running back. Any reason for this? Yeah, I have a reason. He's 33 years old. Yeah, that's a, that's a good place to start. Uh, Thigpen's great. Like, he's still good in open space. He still runs really well. But, uh, yeah, at 33, you you just can't. Not I won't, I won't say can't. Well, it's I mean, so I, I know rare. I mean, Frank Gore's still going, but, I mean. It is so rare to have a 33-year-old starting running back, especially who plays the kind of football that Thigpen plays. Uh, although, I just bet. Just the, the toll it takes. I bet you he... I bet you he is the best. I bet you he is the best in camp, though. At the beginning of the year, when the legs are fresh, he, you know, as a as a vet, he will he will be the guy that the coaches will love the most. As Sankey yeah, and that. Williams wonder where fourth down is, and you know, <laughs> he's just going to come in there. It's going to be like you know, the vet. Boy, he's a pro. He's, 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 a, he's a, a great CFL, CFL pro. running back. He's going to come in. I would. I would. I would. I would bet. He is the starting running back on opening day, and we can make a another wager. You really think so? Yes. All right. One hundred percent. I will bet he is not the starting running back in week four. <laughs> well, no. I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. I mean, you know, thirty-three year old running backs are a uh, um, you know a time sensitive issue. I I think he's going to be a guy who's going to carry the rock through, you know, through mid July. And at that point, you know, I think it would be unfair to expect him to continue. And hopefully by that point, the other guys um, are acclimatized or are ready for for more action. But I, w- I would say right now, Thigpen, I agree uh, with your man, Endzone, um, that Thigpen will be the starter uh, come come the first game. All right. I think this may call for a, a, a wager of some sort. Yeah, but we're definitely going to need some sort of... We uh, will need a wager podcast. Wager... Episode, we've got. Yeah, wager, um, re- you know, recording device. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll come up with that maybe closer to the season. I, I think Williams wins the job. I think he's the starter week one. And 
And I think I think Thigpen looks the best in camp, and Williams gets the job. The last this was a, another tweet from at CFL fans Toronto, and he was wondering about uh, I've got Vince Malley uh, as the inside slot position, and he was asking why in particular I think he's got the edge. Uh, Malley, when you watch him in college, he he had some drop issues. So he dropped the ball quite a lot. But then he put on a bunch of weight and in his sort of tour around the NFL, uh, Baltimore ended up converting him to a tight end. And he was sort of a speed tight end. You know, he was running like end arounds and stuff as a, as a tight end, which was kind of cool. But that's in watching if, you know, if you've had a chance to see my preview of what I think this offense is going to look like in this offense, Dinwiddie relies on the inside slot guy to be a receiver who has the physicality to be able to kick out a defensive end. And so for me, when you look at the way that that Molly plays, he is physical. He's a big guy and he loves contact and he's a punishing blocker too. And so to me, I think Dinwiddie's going to watch him in camp and probably already knows right away. And this might be why they brought him in in the first place. And they're going to say, yeah, this, this is the guy that we want kicking out the D end because the D end is going to be frozen when he sees Vince Molly running at him. Yeah, I I I love that signing. I thought he uh I th- I think he's, you know, he's going to start. I think he's going to be um a really good a really good member of this offense. I'm I'm really excited about what he brings in terms of um like exactly as you say, I think in terms of his physicality and uh um you know, mainly that. But but that's We kind of saw we kind of saw Rod Smith play that role a little bit. Smith played that role a little bit last year and I thought he was he was great you know didn't really get going until the the season got you know, to the halfway point but I thought he was great and I think Malay's a, a step up from him so you know I've I've pretty high expectations for him I I see him as as a starting inside slot yeah and if obviously if you can get that level of blocking um from a receiver that's you know that's hugely important hugely useful to not have to dedicate an offensive lineman to that and the picks that he can set too. And that's another part of Dinwiddie's offense that, you know, he likes those inside guys to get in the way of, of backers coming across, you know, when you're trying to get the ball out to running backs or, or quick outs and stuff like that from, uh, from inside slot guys. So, you know, he'll be, he'll be a presence certainly. All right. <laughs> onto our, onto our last tweet. So this yes. actually three tweets that come from Shaq Richardson. Which, Let's go. Is, Let's go is, Shaq. Uh, but I love that. I love that he got in on this. So Shaq Richardson love it. at Dr. Four underscore unruly. So I put out the depth chart <laughs> and he tweets, you think I'm playing field corner? Laughing, crying face, laughing, crying face, laughing, crying face. Uh, yes. So let me explain this. And I, I explained it politely to, to Shaq and uh, he had a few other things to say. So I've got him at field corner and I know what he's saying. So if you're not familiar with the difference between boundary corner and field corner in the NFL, you often have your boundary corner is like, you know, your, your run stopping corner and often your, your speed corner, your skill corner is, is to the field. Not, not every system. It depends. And everyone plays it differently. Some play sides, some stick with a man, but you know, that's, that's a system that's very popular in the CFL because there's so much space. You often, I don't want to say like hide, guys at field corner but certainly you don't need to be as good in the field because remember if you're the if the ball's on the left hash it's 41 yards to the field uh, sideline it's a long throw and that's just along the line of scrimmage it's a 41 yard throw if you want to hit that sideline and so you can afford to hide a little bit out in the field corner and so so Shaq you know saying you think I'm playing field corner um you know, because it's sort of giving him the the rookie treatment there. And obviously, you know, that's not what he is. What I'm trying to do, and the reason I have him there, is I'm trying to find a way to put both Tommy Campbell and Shaq on the field at the same time. And to me, I don't I don't really care which one's which, whose boundary, whose field. They're both, I think there are two best corners. And so I want them both on, on the field at the same time. Yeah, I, th- I think that, I, I mean, I think that makes sense. What I love, uh, and we had even talked about this earlier, what I love about... Shaq uh is I love you know I love that attitude I love the edge he brings I mean I think that he's a guy that plays on the edge 
And, you know, that's that's always, you know, you know, you got to, you know, but you want blue flame, you get blue flame. And, uh, you know, I think that's great. I think that that can potentially be a real defining trait for this defense. I think this defense has the potential to be, you know, a really physical um, identity driven defense. So I'm I'm all for him uh, LOLing at you. It's such a rarity, too. And the CFL is pretty good. Actually, the players in the CFL have wonderful interaction with with fans and and the media. But yeah, it's it's not often that you that you get input from a from a starting corner on what he thinks yeah, of. The I think it was chart. an absolute. I thought I thought that deal at the time was an absolute steal. Yeah. You know, I oh, still yeah. I still do. I think I think that the fact that they've kept him and they're bringing him back um, means they believe in him, which is terrific. And the, I think all you need to know is that receivers and other teams hate playing against him. And that tells you right away, that's a guy you want on your team. So Shaq responded with a couple of tweets. Um, <laughs> he's, he's talking about it being, it's, you know, I said it's faster in the boundary. And yeah, he's right. Like I was saying before, the boundary corner spot in the CFL means you're going to be going up against the other team's number one guy almost all the time. And the reason for that is because it's a shorter throw for the quarterback. It's an easier throw to make. And whichever receiver is playing to the boundary side is going to get way more balls than the guy playing to the field side. And so, yeah, it is faster in the boundary. It's it's better in the boundary. Everything is is coming at you a little quicker. But, you know, I think Campbell can handle that too. But uh, I will definitely take Shaq's input into account when I make my second depth chart, uh, my depth chart 2.0 coming up. I think there's a pretty good chance, uh, you know, Shaq's argument has won me over. The last thing he said is he started putting out his own. Actually, no, he had two more things to say. So he, he put out his own depth chart. So where he, yeah, where he, he says, uh, I think Tommy and Shaq referring to himself in the boundary, uh, Darby and Jeff free. And then Woody and Botang would be a good starting point. You know, I agree with him with, uh, with obviously with Darby, I've got him starting at, at free. And I, I think, like I said, Campbell, uh, you want on the field with Shaq. So I just divide them up and we agree on, on Botang and, uh, and and Woodson as well. So, yeah, for the most yeah, I love Darby. At, I love Darby at free. Time. Yeah, like don't you? You remember the the Hamilton game last year where he single handedly tortured the Hamilton offense. I know it's the last game of the year, and Hamilton had a bunch of guys in, but you saw how good he was down the stretch and how empty the defensive secondary was when he was injured. Remember, he got hurt early in the fall. Yeah, and well, we got scorched. And then when he came back, suddenly there was. I know we we're playing Ottawa, Ottawa you know, Montreal Hamilton, but, uh, you know, backup Hamilton. Um, but yeah, Darby looked outstanding. So I think until I see someone else play, play better, um, Darby's got to be, he's got to be our starting, our starting free. So, and, and Shaq agrees apparently. And then the last thing Shaq said was, uh, he, oh, I think I, I think I got him. I think I made a, a promise that as long as he keeps scoring touchdowns like that Hamilton pick six, that I would move him to the boundary. And he said that his goal this year is uh, to score more than at Sincerely Toot, uh, which is uh, uh, Daniels. So, uh, and that was, you know, that was something that <laughs> that Daniels got involved in too. And of course, uh, Diverse Daniels responded. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was trying to decide whether or not the team's in a good or bad place if, if Shaq has more points than than Daniels does. Yeah, I I think in a good place. I I do think in a good place. I think I think this is a team that's going to be built on the defense. I think that the defense is um much closer to being uh a completed project. Maybe not completed, but much closer to being um ready to go than the offense. I think the offense is going to be look, we, you know, you and I disagree on this, but I think new quarterback, new coordinator, new coach, new receivers, new linemen. It's going to take longer for the offense and I think, you know, I think this team's going to need to ride the defense. Well, I, I don't disagree um, with you there. I I think it's going to take a while, but I, I think it takes 6 weeks. I think we're counting on the defense for the first 6 games of the season and then after that, I think the offense is is going to take over. But it's going to take some time. Yeah. I agree. It's going to be tough. I mean, you know, it's it's tough, you know, field position and 
you know, I mean, that's what happened last year. Like it's tough. It's tough if you're, if you're not getting drives and you're not getting a blow, um, you know, that's going to be hard sledding. So we'll see. So that'll just about do it for us today on behalf of JB. I'm Ben Grant saying thank you so much for listening. May all your pre-snap reads be good ones. We'll see you next time. Go, go, go. Pull together, fight the foe.